like we do with every seminar. That's Chip. I'm Spencer. Y'all, if y'all didn't know who I was, you wouldn't be here. So, but what we do usually is start off with questions. Anybody have any questions before we get started? That are on your mind because we're on the way. There are well, they're showing up in the creeks now, so they'll be on the beach. I see these little like seaweed things, like little like almost like little ladders on the coming in. It's like oh, it's it's not like that. Like, oh yeah, oh. Those little balls, yeah, that's seaweed. Because it's a thing I saw yesterday, it's already in Crescent, so it's got. Where is it from? Offshore, and then we get a lot of east wind, southeast wind. Atlantic, altitude. It's, it's ridiculous. It's not, yeah. it, and if you don't know, when there's seaweed, I don't know about Chip, but if I go out and the first cast is full of seaweed, I usually reel up and leave. How do you, how do you get away from that? That's, that's a real question, right? Fish with a seaweed? Or, yeah, just like, uh, I don't know, like, is, is, that, just, is that your question? Or like, well, how, the, how is it possible that there's a fish and there's no rocks? No, it's, 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 it's floating by the wind. Yeah, it's floating. Yeah. So, the, the big question is, is, when it's here, where do you go? Oh. Right? <laughs> the other side of the inlet. Because <laughs> it might not be there. It might be. You'll, you'll have to drive to Yukonot. But if it's, if it's loaded here, you might be lucky to be able to fish, you know. Because we're weekend warriors, right? We've got the weekend. So you still want to fish, you want to just pick up your stuff, but you also don't want to reel in 35 pounds of weeds, right? So go find the next inlet. Go to St. Augustine South. Go to Huguenot. Go to Little Talbot. There's always those inlets that might be able to suck, might be sucking all the seaweed in the shore, and it's not on the beach. I'm not, I'm not guaranteeing it, but you can still fish. I've never had any trouble. Yes, sir? Well, you buy the pompano rigs, they normally go standard with the green and the yellow. But I know you know, everybody talks about the beef. So when you first come out to the beef, how important is it to try to maybe throw out a variety of color of beef? Would it really be that much? Or, you know, I, mean, I know like some, some days, uh, you know, white may be doing good, or one day red. I mean, I know you talked about it. So what do you do like when you're first set up as far as? Usually, if I bring four rods. I got four different setups. Usually, they're all this uh, standard two or three boat. Now, we'll see. It wasn't taken before I got down. <laughs> we're going to talk. We're going to talk about rigs too. That's, that's, that's what the big ones today. Yeah, I, okay, I, I tried to throw out a couple of different no, that's colors, a great question. along with so, the standard colors. And I'm, you know, at what point do I say I, I do an hour? Do I go back and change to an oddball color? You see, work. So I got salmon on that one. Light. These are glow beans, so at night they'll actually glow and get out the box. So I don't know what, during the day I'm not real sure what they're doing out there, but they work. On uh, that setup, then I might have a, a dropper rig with two salmon. I got red. I got uh, four or five other colors at home. And this is no lie, Sundays you throw out four rods. And this might be the only beat getting the hit. Yep. Okay, so if that's the only one getting the hit, what should you do with the rest of the Take them off, put them in a bag, and put the, the Surf Casters tournament last year. I had three setups. Then I had a green bean on one. I never even used a green bean. Well, for whatever reason that morning, everything that was eaten was eaten on the green bean. I switched all three rods over to green beans, and the next thing you know, all three rods were going off. Even with the shrimp or clam, the bait, that, that bean, it really made that much of a difference. Yeah. Okay. I'm not a scientist, so I, no, I'm just saying. Like learn, 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 learn. If we could understand it, we would. Uh, I'll talk science a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a scientist, but uh, depths of water changes color. So if we're at 10 feet of water, they're, they're all the same color, roughly. Okay. So, but are we normally fishing at 10 feet of water? No. So what what we see and what a fish sees is different. Okay. This is their eyeballs. There's a whole science about that. Uh, <laughs> what you can, what we see and what they see is totally different. Uh, maybe, maybe it's just this round that they think it might be the eggs, right? This glow might just catch their eye. Okay. Uh, we always, you know, I always start with the Bruno ring, which is an orange and a yellow, because those are bright colors. Except for the bluefish, I don't use the Bruno ring much because guess what? Bluefish like 
if you want to get goofy, I don't know. Yeah. But what, whatever color that you have it will look different in different depths of water. So it might not be in, in four foot of water that it looks the same as if you put it in the, in the big hole, right? So that might be a different color ratio that you need to fish in the big hole that's right over there, right? right? Versus fishing on top of the sandbar. Now, Spencer, Larry Finch, they fish on top of the sandbar a lot. What is it? What, what's it going to emulate them? What are these going to emulate? Sand flea, small sand fleas. Okay, sand flea and the sand flea, right? So, little coquina clams. If you, if you look on the beach, the Jack's Beach is hard, but there's little uh, coquina clams. There's probably some over there, but they're about that big. But it's about the same size. So, it's emulating something. I talked about it with my and they're the same size. Bigger beads don't always mean anything, but you go down south, the coquinas are this big. You can use those big floats, right? Because that's what they're thinking they are. But if it's smaller and colorful, if you're, if you're ever on the beach, one of the beach is just rumbling. Like you know, you see the sand fleas, you see them, but there's sometimes when the beach is full of clams and the beach is just going like this. And it's amazing, I've seen it about four times, but it's not very common, but you just go scoop a handful and you can look at them, okay? And we try to figure out how can we get this on the hook because yeah. when we're catching these fish right there in the surf and cleaning them up, I know he does it too, when we catch fish in the surf, we're always clean. When we clean them, I have to look in their stomach because I want to know exactly what they're eating. And lately they've been full of the little donut clams and sand fleas. So, what does that mean they're feeding? Does that mean they're feeding 100 yards out or where? Uh, the, the, the tournament last week with that Northeast at 25, my daughter caught the winning body for her, the junior, 20 feet out. And the way I found, I was waiting out to throw out, and I hit a hole and it went up to my knees. I said, let's put it right there. Threw it in that little hole, bam. Pounded almost a pound point, like 1.22 pound wide. And my thing is like, well, I should have been throwing there the whole time. Because the thing as that tide comes in, the fish are following the tide. Just because we can't fish a rig in that white watch doesn't mean the fish aren't there. If you watch the ospreys long enough, if you fish the beach long enough, they're diving down where you don't even think there's a fish and they're going out trout and fish all the time. So wherever they're at, that's you know, you gotta that's my thing. Wherever the bait's at, that's where I want my rig. Now some days it's just impossible. Here is open. There's days you know the fish are there, but the current is so strong that when a four or five ounce hook hold, it's time to go home. Because at that point, you're going to be putting a lot of stress on your gills and all that. Quite frankly, the bait is just stripping off the hook. Anything to add to that? I'm going to add Spencer's little comment. He found the hole. And you can see it. You can see what we call a uh, I call it the super highway. Some people call it something different, but I call it the super highway. The fish will run in the deeper waters, right? To come up in here. There's a little trough that runs through there. Well, that trough, that hole was fed, and that, those fish come on in there, and then they make it out. Now, if you go down about uh, six, seven hundred yards, there is a circle. At high tide, the water goes in, and you're not catching fish, but if you're here in the super highway, you're catching fish. And, and you can see that Jack's Beach is really common because there's, there's a hole right over there. It's got a lot of water in it. Well, it's getting fed by something. It's just still up. So find that, find that run out, find that, that super highway and put your bait in it. And that's kind of, uh, Spencer found it and it was really close, right? Sometimes it's really far out. Yeah. That's, that's the key, is find the super highway where the fish are running. 90% of the fish are in 10% of the water. Like we said before, everybody knows, if you don't know, the pier was my, my second home, so when that was open, where that first train is, the low tide, you would never see me pass that fish. Okay? That's good fish, he knows exactly how I fish. Tides in, I'm still fishing, I'm moving with the tide back, fishing shallow. Why? Because, like he said, 90% of the fish that I want to eat are within casting distance. The funniest thing is when the pier is open, I'd be, I would 
be very shallow. In fact, when this pier first opened, right here, there used to be a huge cut. Robert, he used to fish here. He knows. Out up here, coolers full of strong, whitey reds, right here. People would walk by and say, did you catch those here? And I said, yes. And they would go to the end and they'd say, well, I want the good fish. And I said, okay. <laughs> but what that taught me is translating into the surf fishing. Those fish are hanging shallow at the pier. What are they doing down the rest of the beach? They're still in that same zone because one, they want the sand fleets and the donuts and the mold. All of that stuff goes shallow. When the bullet run starts, you see them out here, there's a reason they stay shallow. Because the time. what they'll do, they'll come down the beach shallow. But when they hit the pier, they hate going under the pier. So then they gotta run the gauntlet. They would go out and have to take it all the way around the pier. It looks like bombs going off because the trout, Spanish, and bluefish are destroying them. That's why they stay shallow. All of that bait. But you know what? The fish can go in inches of water. I've caught redfish on this pier like this first thing in the morning. I'll look down and I can see them by the fire. Same thing in these sloughs. I fish early in the morning. And sometimes when I'm trying to catch a bullet, it'll look like a torpedo takes off right next to me. And that was a red just sitting in real shallow. So I've always come with the same conclusion is that it's not always about how far you can cast. Shit knows you want to catch. Don't cast as far as you can. Cast with the fish on. Because if you're casting as far as you can and there's no fish, what's going to happen? You're going to be going to Captain D's or uh, Popeyes for dinner, you know. Everybody you know, feels good throwing far. It doesn't wrong with Captain D's now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it feels good to throw far, but and it doesn't mean the best casters aren't always the best fishermen. A lot of people get out there, you get with your buddy and say, "Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to show him up on you know, good job." Let me reel this one in. Okay? So sometimes, like Spencer said, 20 yards. It's hard to throw 20 yards with a 13-foot rod. It really is. So, back up. Throw it. And yeah, don't let your rod, the rod link, determine how far you're casting because sometimes the fish are right there. So you don't want to cast past where the fish are. I just want everybody to look real quick. So this, this left rod, on the left-hand side of it, see there's water, see the sand over on the left, there's no water. Right there, right there, there's a hole. Where are you gonna fish? Does everybody see what I'm talking about? Right where that guy is, right to the right of it. There's okay, so, all those little. So you can see the sand. Well, you can see clear down there. You can see a little hole. And where then the, the birds sand, are. Yeah. Water's not on it yet. And then right where this guy is, right in front, there's a hole, and it'll show up here. You can see the hole clear down there. Where the three right, seagulls are. Right there. And then there's one right here. So at high tide, when we're sitting up here, high at uh, at the lifeguard stand. Okay, you can cast into that, right? Most people can get there. But that's where the fish will be because it's all fed in there. And this is gonna go away, so I wanted to just point it out. Does everybody see it now? You call that a right run out? Is that a run out? That's a, that's a hole. That's a hole, it's fed by a run out, but it's just a hole. Does everybody see that? So at high tide, once, you, once you're here, you come look at the beach at low tide and you go, that's where I'm gonna fish because your buddy that's sitting to your left 100 yards or 30 yards, or he's fishing on the top of that sandbar right there on accident, he's two and a half foot of, or two and a half inches of water, and you're over here in, in four and a half feet. Does everybody see it? 90% of fish are in 10% of the water. Where that guy's walking out down there, just yep. to the north of him, there's another hole. There's another hole there. And he that's may, also a good spot for sand fleas. Yep. If you're not finding sand fleas, they tend to congregate on the edges of these little drop-offs. So you take your rake and scoop. And if you don't find them at that hole, go to the next one. The sand fleas are a lot like fish. They might be in one hole, but not the next. Last year on the south side of the pier, there was a massive cut. You, there? you can scoop one time with this rake and it would be full to the top of sand fleas. You would go to the next cut. That's deep, scoop, nothing. So just like the fish, move. Same with, like he said, the holes and runouts. If you find a good runout on the beach, you're not getting any bites. Go to If you see another one, go to the next one. The fish don't always just sit in one area. They, they constantly move. And uh, in Ponte Vedra, in the, around December, I was fishing, there's three different runouts. Fish the first one, I call like three or four fish. Move to the next one, three or four fish. Went to the next one, 30 fish. 
I don't know why they do it, but that's they're like us. We don't all congregate at the same restaurant every night, so the fish are the same. And my general rule of thumb, if I find a good run out, I honestly, me, I give it 10 minutes. If I throw out, I don't have a bite within 10 minutes. I use I'll throw out one rod or two rods on each side of the run out. No bites, get up the food. Because look, those run outs are like a buffet bar. When the fish are in there, they're hitting just like that. That's what happens. What happens if you know that the fish are there? Spencer put this in his, in his uh, this, is a, this is a pro tip. He, he put it on Facebook yesterday. I think it was yesterday. Probably. Okay. So if you know, and you got the fish there yesterday, and you know that there's fish there, you pick one up, or you had to, you, you know that you saw one, the ospreys are diving, what's your next option if you know the fish are there? Change your beans, what else? Change your bait. Great idea. And then Spencer says, I call it loose lining. Yep. Set your sinker. Great tip. Set your sinker. Sputnik, let it hold. Tighten it up. Let the line float. That thing's going like this now. Now you got more action. Okay? Does everybody understand that? So if you know the fish are there, you go, well, the beach is full. The beach is absolutely full of people. I'm in Milano. Five rods on each way, you go. I gotta know a trick that no one else is doing. Loose line that thing. You might be get lucky. Because you're not gonna move because you gotta go to St. Augustine or come to Jack's Beach, right? Because the beach is completely full. That's a pro tip for coming today, so that, that'll help you. Not everyone agrees with it, but uh, it works. But I, I've used it over the years, and uh, so when I'm throwing this out, on a day like this, obviously, you don't need to do any shaking of the line. No. But are we always fishing when it's rough? No. A lot of times in Jack's Beach in the summer, it's fairly calm. So I'll throw that line off, and I'm sure people think I'm crazy because I'll go from each rod, and I'll just go like this. Shake it. And I'll go to the next one. And I don't know how many times. I need a video of it because as soon as you do it, it'll go like that. Same thing on the pier when it was open. I'd go to Sputnik out, fishing for Pompadour Whiting. It's out there. The rod's laying on the rod holder, you know. I'm grabbing, and the line's tight, I grab it. When nobody even knows what I'm doing, I'll go like this. And then you feel the bite and go, and they'll go, well, why are they biting yours? It's all about movement. Because when they're eating sand fleas, are those sand fleas, you think the sand fleas are just sitting there going, waving at the, they're not there, they're not wanting to get any, any bait in the water. Their goal is to stay alive. So they, they're trying, those sand fleas, when the wave's going out, you watch them, they are digging in fast. So when you're throwing out there, just that little bit of extra movement, a pompadour whiting, they got pretty good eyesight. I catch whiting on a flow rig with live shrimp, so I know they got good eyesight because I've seen them come up chasing the shrimp. Who would think a whiting would do that, but they do. So you add that little bit of extra. You gotta employ everything in the arsenal because some days you have to, other days it doesn't matter. But uh, like Chip said, that movement is key. That's why when it's rough like this and you can hit a sandbar, Usually you do really good, especially in the fall. Right now, the whiting are sort of telling off of the rising water tips. The last fall, me and Matt were fishing here, throwing sand fleas on that sandbar. I mean, we were fishing 15, 16, 17 inch whiting. All on sand fleas, along with drum, reds, and sheep. All on just that one bait. Put shrimp on there, they didn't want the shrimp. That's why when me and Chip go, we never just bring shrimp. We can usually have two to three baits. Like we said, clean the stomachs, you'll find out what they're eating. In the fall, the shrimp actually run down the beach. A lot of people don't know that, but the shrimpers could come right up close to the pier, that area, they would. My buddies, uh, kingfish, when they're throwing the net for pogies, they catch shrimp all the time along the beach in their nets. They're usually big. So have you ever caught a fish or whiting and say, how does this fish have three or four shrimp in its stomach? Because I didn't feed them that many times. Well, that's because there's shrimp up and down the beach. I have, and I'll, I'll be like, where did all these shrimp come from? Because I know they didn't get mine, because I'm breaking mine into pieces, and I got a hook. But in the fall, sand fleas and shrimp right along the beach, tons of them. So, thanks. Uh, I have a question. Yes, giveaway of some fish. Look. Take a good one.
All right, I got some fish gum from Tony, the manufacturer. So in order to give it away, I got a random number generator up here that's working between... I get the phone here. Three and 45. What we'd like you to do is if you use it, write a report that you use it and what you caught, and if you caught anything with it. So anybody that wants to do that, that's fine. Give me a number between 3 and 45, and the first one to give you the number will get a pack, and we'll do that until all 10 packs are gone. Let's do this. 45, 39, 43, 22, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, Hey, hey, Remember to write a report no when you use them. Next one. 14. 11. 12. 17. 9. 17. 14. 33. 33. 37. 37. Okay. Next one. 5. 31. 36. 37. 11. Next one. 21. 21. 21. 21. <laughs> Next number. What'd you say? Next number. Nine. Thirty-eight. Got two left. You said one. No, you can't get two. Oh, okay. oh, 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 oh. Oh. This one's green, that one's uh, blue. All the same flavor. What? All the same flavor? All the same flavor, just different right. colors. I like what I got. So so next number. Eight. Come on. Here. Right here. Right here. What did you say? Nine. Last one. Okay. Five. Low number. Two. One. Eight. Eight. Six. Five. Six. You're right in between them. <laughs> there you go. Please write a report when you use it. Where can we buy it? You got to buy it online. Okay. He doesn't have a distributor on this coast. It's really popular on, on the Gulf Coast. Fishgum.com? Just, just put in Fishgum, it'll take you to his fish right. Facebook page. Yeah, where are we writing the report to? No, you write it on Broken Wheel 23. He's okay. on our site. All right. <laughs> That's me. You write it on his site. Tony's already a member. You've probably seen his comments. If not, we All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, talk about rigs. Spencer's gonna, I'll, I'll cover, I'll cover double drop, I'll let Spencer cover, um, you know, I'll just cover, I'll cover a little bit of science that I've found over the years about the double drop. Uh, with this, single snood versus double snood, okay? So, this is, Spencer will tell you how to tie this, because I don't know how to tie this exact one. I use, I, I use girl brand for a, a fishing mortician most of the time very similar uh, style but one tied on there if you get a rig board everybody's seen my video on how to make a rig board you can make your own uh, just as easy also if you can cut the two in half make a longer one tie the knot so it doesn't come loose the, the problem with the double of one single line with two loops is if you get bit off you might lose your sinker right so 
Tie the knot extra good so you don't lose it. Lose your sinkers. Okay? It doesn't matter if it's a sinker guy, sinker, or a pyramid. It's still, you just don't want to lose it. And then, yeah, and then, so we talk about fluorocarbon versus uh, versus mono, right? And a lot of people, I, I hear it all the time. Oh, I threw off another six sinkers this week. I need to stop by the house. Well, what do you think they're tying their main line with? Fluorocarbon. Stretch. I like it. The sinker guy makes more money. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, make your rig. Make your rig. You, we're not required in this area to make it out of fluorocarbon. We went over the panhandle. We whopped on the fish, Dad and I, and we didn't have fluorocarbon mainline. I had fluorocarbon snoots, right? Because it's a lot clearer. But you don't have to have make the make the main out of fluorocarbon. When the fluorocarbon stretches, it doesn't come back like mono. Mono will stretch, come back, stretch, and come back. And you can see that. Okay, you see my hands pull apart? It will come back. Well, fluorocarbon stretches and breaks. So then you go, I don't know why my sinker. You grab, you grab a new 13 foot over the bar from Mark and you go, I don't know why my 25 or 20 pound fluorocarbon keeps breaking. I'm losing my sinker. I just told you. Okay? Make your main out of, if you're going to make the portition rate, make it out of, out of mono, not out of fluorocarbon. Make the snoods out of fluorocarbon. If you throw one of those off, it's just a hook. Right? You get a bit off, it's just a hook. Okay? So the fish are, are not necessarily going to see this. One of the better, one of the better pompano fishermen I know, Paulos, if you watch any of my videos, he's a big, big game fisherman, but he catches uh, lots of pompano. What do you think his snoods made out, or his, his main lines made out of? Fifty or sixty pound trick fish. What? You can't, you can't. It's not possible, right? Buddy, that's what he uses, and he catches a lot of fish on it. Okay. So now, do I use fifty or sixty? No, I don't. But does that make sense? wants to reel in a shark, he wants to make sure that he keeps a sinker, okay, and why, why not? That's the real question. So double drop versus single drop. Why, why do we want a double drop? Or we even see triple drop sometimes, right? Why do we do that? Different water columns, different levels, right? So if you're fishing a double, or if you're fishing on the sand, on top of the sandbar, do you need a double drop? Probably not. If you're fishing a deep, big, deep hole, double drop. If you're fishing a real deep, deep hole, a triple drop. Okay, down south you can get on those high impact beaches. Way down south, Jupiter. Some of those are real high impact. You can fish a triple drop. You see that a lot down there. The guys down there fishing triples or the doubles. Okay, so and uh, the green bead, green and yellow bead, which it comes on the tackle crafter generic rig with a kale hook. Okay? Don't use a kale hook. That is Don't use a kale hook. So kale, the one big thing with, um, there, we'll talk about, we're not gonna, I'll talk about it on a video, but active versus uh, inactive hooks. Like a circle hook is an inactive hook. You don't have to use, you don't have to have a hold of it, you don't have to pull it to set the hook. Uh, a wide bend hook is an active hook. You have to actually reel, you have to set it so it hits. I'll pass these are the Eagle Paul. I'll pass these around if y'all want to look. These are the hooks me and Chip use. Yep. Your Eagle Paul 197. Uh, you, you'll have a hard time finding them because I just bought the last 10,000, I think. <laughs> so they'll be on in the online store, but um, we were everybody was having trouble finding that up that two on. So I just I found uh, 10,000 of them. So uh, Academy probably won't have them. Uh, but double versus a single, does everybody make does that make sense? Why we, we why we'd switch? Why else would we, we throw a single versus a double? It's blowing 25. One throws a lot farther if you gotta get to the hole than two. Yes. Okay? So if, if you can't throw it with, with two because it catches the wind, right? Then drop it to one. Does that make sense? For everybody? Just the top, because we're already using a Sputnik, so does everyone here use a Sputnik when they're surfishing? 
Hey, Spence, I got a question yeah. about that Sputnik. Yeah. So I've always used Pyramid uh, throughout my you know, fishing experience, yeah. and now I'm using those Sputniks. They dig in so deep at some points that I don't, I'm doubtful about feeling the hit from the fish, and when I'm dragging it in, when I'm reeling it in, you have to have so much tension on your rod. I'm afraid that when I'm bringing it in, I'm losing my bait doing that as, as well. Unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't. Are you using the sinker? I'm, I am. I just bought a bunch of your stuff. You're reeling this in. If they're not doing this, something's wrong. Yep. I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk about tuning it. Yeah, thank okay. Tuning happens to be the. What happens to be when I'm right? Yes, sir. We're going to talk about that real quick. So if you're. Anyway, if you're. If you're. If you're leaving your bait, if the water's moving like this and you're leaving your bait out there for more than 15 minutes, guess what you're going to do? It's going to bury your sinker, right? So walk it down, walk that way, 50 yards, walk back this way, 50 yards. But the easiest is they have variable tension technology. The wire is, you could pinch it, it gets tighter. Okay? Pull it apart. If it's not releasing, that's the issue that you're having, it's not releasing. Pull it apart. Give it, don't, don't latch it so it's so tight that you can't get it to release. When the fish hits the it's supposed to come back. It's supposed to come in just like that. And that's the reason that it's superior is we want to bring this up onto the beach and we don't want the pompano, out. We don't want the pyramid, which is a flat front, to catch in the main trough. How many people have lost their pompano right there? The biggest one you've ever had, right? Yeah. Right in the wash because my pyramid sticks and I pull it and then my pyramid shoots out at me <laughs> and then the fish is now got on a loose line. So, I will tell you that not all manufacturers of this, okay, we use the right diameter of wire so we can, so it will release, okay? So when you were, uh, uh, when you were bending those metal pieces, yes. um, I didn't quite in, uh, understand what the purpose was. Could you explain you, that again? You pinch, you pinch it if you need it to get tighter. If, it, it if it's not holding, pinch it tighter. And then it'll slip onto the weight a lot tighter. And then it'll hold on, it'll it'll hold, it'll hold harder. So then when the fish hits, now the other thing is is the main question is is if is it going to if this is in the ground, how am I gonna see the see the bite? Right. It doesn't matter. This sinker doesn't move, the end of the rod moves when right. the fish hits this. Well, um so if I make it tighter, is it still going to release? Uh, no, your problem is, is it's too tight. So we really yeah. pull them apart. Pull them apart, okay. Yeah, pull them apart. Yeah, so, make it so, yeah, so, so then they'll the open up easier. Okay. And then also, when when it's ripping like this, 15 minutes is about all you're going to have. There's enough sand that's coming over the top of that. I mean, you're going to get your pyramid stuck too. And don't just start oh, yeah. Just if you it feels like way. it's stuck, just walk real slow. Yep, you walk, or walk, else walk one way, walk the other way. So and then you'll yeah. feel it give. If you, if you try to horse it in, the chances are you're going to pop the line. So that's the difference between a short and a long stem. So if it's sat here and I ha I need to get it to loosen up, I'm going to pull it, go to walk down the beach, I'm going to pull it this way. I walk down the other way, I pull it this way, now the thing pops out. Does everybody understand? Short sinker won't do that. Okay? And the other thing, short sinker will get stuck up in your rig. <laughs> That's why we all buy the sinker guy sinkers. Yes, sir. And just on top of that, so we're using a spudding. Like you said, this sticks. It's not moving. Like a storm sinker, I don't use pyramids. I use storms. But if there's a lot of current, I do not use this because it'll move. So when this is out there, it's still top of that. You're already using circle hooks. And do you only use your uh, pyramids or your storm sinkers for the uh, fish finder rig? Yes. Okay. Yes. Because on a double, I want tension so when the fish hits. What you, so here's the fish. You think you have to set the hook? You got a double whammy going on. You got a circle hook and a sputnik. That's the anchor. That fish is hitting. He's pulling. So like we used to say on the pier, don't be a jerk. One of those guys that goes like that. Because guess what? Even with a circle hook, when you set that hook hard,
fleas. And that's why lately I'm only using small sand fleas as well because if you put a big sand flea on, all you'll see is the rod, usually it'll be one little tap and then it'll just go like this. And it, literally you're just going like this, holding it, because you're not usually going to turn a 150 pound sea right across the beach. And if the fish are biting, you really want to waste your time doing that. No, so. How tight do you generally keep your drag uh, when it's just the uh, lot? I'm sorry, the weight's just sitting there in the water. I like to be able, with my hand to be able to pull it out, but not uh, with some tension, because like I said, even these are the sand spikes I use. I right. used to use PVC no longer because one, if a good wave comes along, it'll actually pop that PVC up. But these guys hold, and uh, I've had a couple race hit, and the rod, you know, the pulling, this never moved. Uh, somebody yesterday, I think, was it yesterday somebody lost the rod? I think on the Florida Surf Angler website they were saying, hey everybody, make sure you keep your drags loose because I just lost the rod. That, that'll ruin your whole fishing day, won't it? with this, this uh, Carolina rig, this is the one I'm fishing right behind the breakers, real shallow. On the pier, I'm using an egg sinker and a leader, Carolina rig. All it is, it's such a simple, it's just a snap swivel, and I put the bead there, because if you don't, you'll have swivel on swivel, and that tends to spin it up. And then I got a 25 pound piece of fluoro, and on these, uh, because I'm using sand fleas on this one, I'm using a uh, owner j -Hook. It's, I think it's SSW, it's two eye, or one eye. Active or inactive? Yeah. An active hook. Yeah, there it is. So you have, you have, you you have to, to set the hook with the Carolina rig, okay? Yeah. Unless you're using circles, but even then, 90% no of the time tension. you're not going to, you're not going to, the circle hook's not going to hook if, if there's not tension. So yes. it's not going to, it's definitely not going to hook, it's not going to set the hook if you think that you're going to set the hook with the circle hook. The circle hook needs to be fit and then pulled, ran away with, and it sinks its Spencer fishing Carolina rig, you have to be ready. When you feel it, whoop, yeah. now I got it. Okay. Wide bend, same thing, whoop. So, difference between active and, and, and passive hooks. We'll, we'll cover that, but that, that's, that's gonna give Spencer the ability to catch the drum and when, when he can feel it. And that's when you, Spencer, 90% of the time, has a rod in his hand. Yeah. Right? So gives you the building. I got the great burst. Spencer wants me to so why, uh, record this. Why, and my phone's overheating and running Spencer out of data. Do you have your phone? Swivel, this post lock versus the plastic one with the pedal on it. What's that? It, it twists, but what else? It doesn't break. You can get these no. anywhere and they don't break. They're inexpensive. I don't know right? how to do that. So that <laughs> And you're going to keep your sinker. The other one, if you're fishing, prime example, if you're fishing for tarpon or Thank something you. where where a tarpon can, can throw your weight, guess what you want to do? Put the plastic one on there. Yes. So it throws it off. You go, oh, I lost my five dollars, but I got my tarpon, right? Because different fish, different fishing gives you the ability to catch different fish by choosing the tackle that you have. Spencer's going to target what with this rig? Redfish, drum, and sheephead. Yeah. Yep. So you had a mono leader for the double drop and then a fluoro for the Yes, because a lot of times, like, if I'm catching mullet, I got the fluoro on there because, believe it or not, mono are quite picky. I'm just, that's sort of sarcastic. They're very picky. They got very good eyesight. And sometimes just the littlest things, they'll be like, nah. Now, when I'm fishing for trout on the bottom, there's no bean. No bean. And usually, I'll have an egg sinker because I like to throw it in the sleeves and then drag it. Just that little bit of movement, that mullet, that you'll feel a pump pump, boom. And we got to be honest, we, I love surf hooks, but man, it's a great feeling when you can lay into it and feel it. It's like, you know, playing baseball, you hit that sweet shot, you can feel it. And when those drum and stuff are hitting and you're setting that hook on them, that knows it's a good feeling, ain't it, when that rod starts going like that. But uh, So, what Spencer's talking about is targeting different species. The question is, what did you guys come for? What, what do you want to learn how to catch? That's, is anybody, is it whiting and pompano, number one? Trout, everything. Trout, okay, everything. So trout, he just gave you the trout secret. Trout. If, if, if you're gonna, 
we'll trout, way. reds, drum, mainly. Flounder. I'm Flounder, yes, sir. Probably. So, uh, you lying. Today. so does everybody understand it's different styles to catch different styles of different types of fish? If you if you're going to use a double dropper and you come out and say I'm going to catch a bunch of black drum, I'm going to sit right next to Spencer today. I'm going to have my nice fucking sinker and I'm going to out fish him today. No, you ain't. No. Nope. I promise you. Okay, but because he's he's chosen the right rig to target the right fish, right? What's going to happen? You're going to go away saying, man, these double hook rigs suck. No, they don't. It's, you target each fish a different way. Yeah. It's just it's just how it is. I mean, if you, you have three different setups, so honestly, uh, me and Matt been fishing a long time. We're hot. We know exactly what we're going for. So I'm just bringing that rig. But we always always bring a backup because what you're going for might not be biting. So if you want to switch over. Like always have a trout rig and a trout rig. So this is the, the trout rig I use. Very simple guys. Has anybody used the, the float rig with the adjustable knot? You want to get the uh now let me see if I can find it. I always misplace the rubber. So we'll uh, we'll cover I'll, I'll just cover some stuff. How many people can find the floats right now? <laughs> Are you referring to like actually oh, buying it in the, the store? Good yeah, these are the good ones. Oh, the Strike Zone or BNM? I don't, I don't know if Strike Zone has them. I can see them in there. I, I, I didn't see them. I didn't. Okay, they're hard to find right now, aren't they? Because yeah. everybody that's not fishing right now has them at their house. Yeah. So they, they've got to be more made. So a little bit of information. Come back in, that a little bit. So these are the knots. All it is is basically the little pre-made knot. You slide it onto the line, pull it off the tightness. So what this this will be your depth finder. That's how. So when I throw out, if I want to fish six inches below the surface, guess what? When I throw out. That's where it's blown along. A lot of people that see me fishing with this think they look at this and just say, "Oh, well, he's not that deep." Well, sometimes I have that knot and it's on the reel. I'm fishing ten foot down, twelve foot down. What does stop stop not find the fish that way? Some days the trout are that deep. Other days, of all you're getting is bluefish, ladyfish, but are moving deeply because blues and ladyfish feed on the, the top of the water column. A lot of times the trout are sitting on the bottom and they're just waiting for the shrimp to float over the top of them. So put the stop knot on and they come with a little bee, okay? But what I do, I also add another little bee because sometimes what happens is this small bead will actually, it'll crack, I've seen it crack right here and then you're going out and you're... Yeah, so you had a mono leader for the double drop and then a fluoro for the... Yeah, so because a lot of times like if I'm catching bullet, I've got the fluoro on there because believe it or not, trout are quite picky. I'm, that's sort of sarcastic. They're very picky. they got very good eyesight. And sometimes just the littlest things, they'll be like, nah. Now when I'm fishing for trout on the bottom, there's no bead. No bead. And usually I'll have an egg sinker because I like to throw it in the sluice and then drag it. Just that little bit of movement, that mullet, and you'll feel a thump thump, boom. And you got to be honest, we, I love certain hooks, but man, it's a great feeling when you can lay into it and feel it. It's like, you know, playing baseball, you hit that sweet shot, you can feel it. And you know, those drum and stuff are hitting and you're setting that hook on them. Matt knows it's a good feeling, man. So that's why it starts going like that. But, uh, so, what Spencer's talking about is targeting different species. The question is, what did you guys come for? What, what do you want to learn how to catch? That's, is anybody, is it whiting and pompano, number one? Trout, everything. Trout, okay, everything. So trout, he just gave you the trout secret. Trout. If, if you're gonna. We'll go over that. Trout, reds, drum, mainly. Flounder. I'm Flounder, yes, sir. So. So, does everybody understand that it's different styles to catch different styles of different types of fish? If, you, if you're going to use a double dropper and you, you come out and say, I'm going to catch a bunch of black drum, I'm going to sit right next to Spencer today, I'm going to have my nice bunch of sinker, and I'm going to out fishing today. No, you ain't. No. Nope. I promise you. Okay? But because he's, he's chosen the right rig to target the right fish, right? What's going to happen? You're going to go away saying, man, these double hook rigs suck. No, they don't. It's, you target each fish a different way. It's just, it's just how it is. I mean, if you have three different setups, oh, honestly, 
me and Matt have been fishing a long time. We caught. We know exactly what we're going for, so I'll just bring that here. But we always always bring the backup because what you're going for might not be biting, so you want to switch over. Like I always have a drum rig and a trout rig. So this is the, the trout rig I use. Very simple, guys. Does anybody use the, the float rig, the adjustable knot? You want to get the... Uh, now let me see if I can find it. I always misplace it. Right? So we'll, uh, we'll come, I'll, I'll just cover some stuff. How many people can fly in the floats right now? <laughs> you can't wear it. Are you referring to like actually buying it in a okay. store? Yeah. Oh, it's a Strike Zone or BNM? I don't, I don't know if Strike Zone had it. I didn't see it in there. Like, I didn't see it. Hey, they're hard to find right now, aren't they? Because everybody that's not fishing right now has them at their house. Yeah. So they, they've got to be more made. So a little bit of information. You might have to end that a little too? Yeah. Okay. So uh, these are the knots. All it is is basically little pre-made knot, you slide it onto the line, pull it off and tighten. So when this this will be your depth finder. That's how so when I throw out if I want to fish six inches below the surface, guess what? When I throw out that's where it's floating along. A lot of people that see me fishing with this think they look at this and just say, oh well he's not that deep. Well sometimes I have that knot and it's on the reel. I'm fishing 10 foot down, 12 foot down. And what this stop stop knot you find the fish that way. Some days the trout or that deep. Other days, how far you're getting is bluefish, ladyfish. You better move it deeper because blues and ladyfish feed on the top of the water column. A lot of times the trout are sitting on the bottom and they're just waiting for that shrimp to float over the top of them. So we put the stop knot on and they come with a little bead, okay? But what I do, I also add another little bead because sometimes what happens is this small bead will actually, it'll crack. I've seen it crack right here and then you're throwing out and your, your float will lay sideways, okay? If you throw out and your float lay sideways, you know what that means? You're on the bottom. There's no tension there. I've seen people just put this knot on here and guess what? It goes over it and they're like, well, I'm fishing the same depth as you. No, you're not. You're fishing on the bottom. If you ever see it like that, you're on the bottom. You need to adjust it. And then we just have the float. Now, there's a couple of styles. I think I thought I had both of them. Well, no. Anyway, this is the only one you should buy. There's another one that has a slit down the middle where you can pull that pin out. And that's for like if you just want to have a set bobble. That little slit, what do you think happens when you're throwing out? Like that. And then you're like wondering why is my float at an odd angle? That's because that slit is staying up. So he has them, floats with no slits, and then I use an ounce and a half XC. I was using an ounce, but then on a rough day out here, I said, well, let me try a little bit heavier. And then I found out the one and a half ounce hollow one doesn't cast much further. These little floats, they don't look like they're tough, but man, it, it holds it just right. You got about that much above the surface, and you'll just see that float shoot under. And then I use 15 pound lead. That's it. What, uh, what brand do you use? This, this, is, this is a key here. Right now, I'm using the diamond. Diamond, yep. Very, very thin leader. Pass if you watch my video, you pass it. I have, I have a different. Uh, I use a different. Uh, That's fifteen. Carbon, yeah. But that diamond, it's a local company. Real awesome people. Uh, great, great leader. And why do I use fifteen pounds? There's a couple of reasons. One, the trout, like I said, have very good eyesight. You use a thirty-pound leader, you may catch one or two trout, but you're not going to get that many. The only drawback to using light line like that is bluefish, jacks, and even ladyfish will spray it. And so that's why I'll you can never have enough oh, wiping hooks. This is a sort of a faded pack. I buy them at 50, 50 at a time, and this stays in my back pocket when I'm fishing. Because when I reel in and I don't have a hook, I just pop one on right there. I'm not worried about losing a two-cent hook because I want to catch fish. So when you're using a heavier leader, you're not going to lose your hooks, but you're not going to catch the fish. You're going to catch that blue fish. And another thing, I've actually done this in a uh, aquarium. Heavier leader versus lighter. You put a shrimp on a 15 pound leader. Guess what? He's actually able to swim around. That heavier leader 
It's like lifting weights to him. He's not an ant. He doesn't have that strength of an ant. He's just an underwater cockroach. That's all the shrimp is. So he's just, he'll just be dangling there. That's how it is. I mean, people just don't understand. They, they don't believe I'm using this line of leader until I show them. And then they start catching fish. It's all about my The drum, redfish, flounder. Now, if you are, you can target flounder with this ring as well. By the pier, in the river, along the rocks. What I do there, shorten the leader. It'll be much shorter And what you want to do before you even start fishing. Find how deep the area is you are. So if you start off deep and you got your float like that, right? And you keep going until the float is standing up. That way, guess what? You're right off the bottom. Where do the flounder feet? Right. So then you let it drift, and then what happens, unlike a trout when the float shoots under, you'll see the float just stop, and it'll just barely sink. Guess what you have? You got a flounder. Oh, he'll run. Yeah, or he'll start swimming off. But uh, I use a long leader because I like that shrimp to swim around. If the air was open, and we could see the trout. There's only a few of us who would constantly be catching them because we had the long leader. And some days when the water's clean, this is too short. Bay fished up there, she knows. Some days I had a three foot leader and I'm like, man, this is too long, but guess what? The trout were hit. You go shorter in clean water. I forgot to mention it earlier. With like the Carolina rig and uh, even the double hook rigs, the cleaner the water, the less tackle. On that clean water days, and all you're catching is bluefish, what should you do with these beans? Take off everything, just put bait. And it, it'll actually help your catch. You'll still get the bluefish because they're like piranhas and they'll eat anything they come come across. But when you take away that added eye feature to them, those whiting are really thanking you because now they got a bill and then you got a bill. You gotta fight. I gotta feel special. That's my, that's my wife's custom rod that I have commandeered because I like it so much and it catches a lot of fish. Weighted or non-weighted? Huh? Weighted or non-weighted? Non-weighted. Okay. Um, this is what happens when you use a weighted weighted float. You already got your weight. You throw out, what do you think happens? It actually causes a helicopter type effect. And it will be tangled up all day long. You just want that initial weight. Because when you're throwing out, this is what lands first. Sometimes you're throwing those weighted floats. Well, if this lands first, the, the float, because it's weighted, your, your actual weight will tangle on the top. And that, those, those are the days you're ready to give up fishing every time you throw out, you're tangling up. When you know the fish are there, if you can't get to them, there's nothing worse than that. Any questions on the float? Uh, the only question, I'm, I'm sorry, did I interrupt someone? No. Uh, Clay, did you say that you were selling them at your on your website? Yeah, we'll, we'll, have, the whole, we'll have the whole trout set up. Wide bend hooks. Uh, Spencer number just four. talked about uh, a number four. We'll have number six and a number two. Why would, why, number two is actually a bigger hook. Why, for, why would I want to come Mullet, mullet. Trout are gonna love the mullet because we, a number, a number six or number four will bend out on a, on a big redfish. Uh, number number two will. Well, and, and with mullet, when, we're using, when the mullet run starts in the fall, you got reds, big blues, big trout cruises the surf. If you're using a number four, or number six hook, you'll get the bite. But what do you think's happening? That because the mullet are usually three to four inches, so you got a small hook. Well, the fish is grabbing the, the bait, but the hook's not in their mouth. You go to that number two, it gets there right in the corner. And, and another thing with mullet, I always let them eat it. Unless it's a red, you'll know right away when it's a red because they just slam it. It's gone. Trout, what they do, I've seen it, they'll suck it in, spit it out, suck it in, spit it out, and then they'll eat it. So when you're fishing for trout, you know it's trout. Boom, 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 boom. A lot of people want to set the hook right away, right? Isn't that our initial reaction? The very first bite, we're going like this. Nope, not with the, the mullet. I feel the bite, and then I'll actually wait until they'll start to swim off with it. You got it. Boom. So I, I, other than shrimp, what about like with, uh, catching croaker in to try to catch trout? Stingrays. Uh, you're right. Croakers work. Like on the West Coast, they work great. You go down to Sebastian, you put a croaker out there, you're catching snook, reds, and trout all day. Here, you put a croaker on, it's Stingray City. Most annoying thing, because you know they work. But the sea rays beat you to it. Oh, man. We're going to, any other questions? We're going to go over some of the baits, too. So that'll be next. Yep. 
close to its body. And this is how I hook it. Does that hook go all the way through or you just, just the tip? Through the shell bird? And down, and through that little flapper and out the top. Okay. If everybody, I mean. You never go out the side? Don't go off the side. Don't. This is his face right here. These are his eyes. He has little eyes down right. there. Right. That's his butt. <laughs> and no, he will not dig in once he's hooked. It's like a I always hear, hey, well, how do you stop him from digging in? Trust me, he's not digging in with a, he can't dig in any longer because he's hooked. Is he dead? Yeah, I didn't want to kill him. I And they're flying off. They should. Okay. okay, I've seen a lot of comments about, hey, my sand fleas are flying off. When out I hook them hand. like this, I never have that issue. I, they're coming out of my hand. I couldn't get to them. Oh, well, that. <laughs> yes, hold on, hold on, hold on. I can do that. I've got a secret. Uh oh. If. My suggestion is when you're finding the sand fleas, though, if you get a soft sand flea, let them go. Because although the fish absolutely love them, if you're having to cast it out there, where do you think that flea's going? Wait. It's going one way and your weight's going out. It's just too soft. That means they just bolted and they're not going to work. So when, when Spencer pushes that, that hook through the, the tail, what's that do? It closes the eggs right at the hook. So what's that? Where's the fish going to eat? You're going to eat your hook. Makes sense. That's why you would hook it there, not somewhere else. Okay. It's real simple. I mean, how, how far in the tail do you get to hook it? I think it's coming around. I go through out. I go right out the top. Just when I have that point of the hook. You have the point that's coming right out the top. Point out the bar. Yeah. If you're throwing, yeah, the bar, the bar, right out the top. The, oh no, the very tip, the very tip. Yeah. Just enough, because you want that little bar to still in it. When they're sand fleas this size, they should not just be falling off the hook. If they're falling off the hook, something's wrong. 
Sometimes a, a stringer is what I call it. And that is also, what's it do? The stringer, boom, it's moving a lot, right? Sometimes it's what the pompano needs. So this one's a little smaller, so I just cut this in half into, for two baits. But a bigger one, you could have three. Now, these are messy. Have a towel. Okay? All you're going to do. I've had really good luck with the pompano uh, with a white sand flea, or sorry, white clam, clam or crab uh, fish bite. And I just top, I'm just gonna go right through the color. I like that, and I'm gonna go one more time through. Just like that, okay? Why, why would I put a fish bite with it? Holds it on, but what else? It looks like the shell of a coquina clam. Okay, so what? 90% of the clams that we're seeing are what? What color on the beach? White. So I'll sometimes cut my my fish bite in half. So then I lay that right, put the fish bite on first, put that one right over the top. So now it looks like the clam, a real clam, is in its shell. What are they going to do? Grab it, crunch it, try to suck that clam out of there. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you got a lot of clams and you can't use them all that day, uh, what I've always done in the past is crack them, cut them, and salt them. Yes, sir. I got a video on that. Also, it toughens, them, toughens them up, and man, you can 
sling it as hard as you want, it's not coming off the hook. Most of you probably don't have as good of a wife as I have, <laughs> uh, but I have a bait fridge. <laughs> and what I do with clams is I'll keep them in a bucket, in a just a little academy bucket, and I'll just put them all in there and then uh, alkaline water. I don't want to use tap water, but I'll just I'll have my towel just like this. I'll wet it with alkaline water and put it on the top and put it in the fridge. My last my last hundred that I bought lasted four and a half weeks. Okay, so if you buy a bunch of them, you can have them if you store them correctly. But just make sure they're not sitting in a bunch of water. Dump the water out. Just kind of rinse them off. Give them some life. Let them, let them understand that they can live. But that water is the enemy of fresh bait. Yeah, bait. unless it's live shrimp or live mullet. The chlorine in the water that we're drinking will kill most of the stuff. So I just use bottled water, alkaline water. With the clams, uh, the frozen ones that you buy in the bait shop, that yeah. work? I, I don't know. I wouldn't buy them. Uh -huh. I don't buy them. A lot of people use them. They work. But what I would suggest is buying them today before you fish and salt them. Because yeah. what I've seen, I've, I've had them given to me fishing out there before, and I've tried them. They're real, real soft, right? Has anybody used the frozen clams? Yeah. They're not real firm, are they? So if you salt them the night before you go, that'll toughen them up. And that's where put, actually putting the fish bites really does help because if you look at like the clam flavored fish bites, is this the right color, I hope? Okay, so you got that color. It looks real similar to a clam, doesn't it? So you're just cutting that little strip and putting it above the hook and in the clam. So in theory, what's gonna happen is that fish is gonna come along chew on the clam, well he's going to be chewing on that fish bite too and not realize it and then he's going to be hooked. Nope. Because he's going to stop biting on that hook if there's no bait left, right? We don't eat on an empty plate. We want something on that plate at all times. So everybody has a different preference on how they want to cut their, their fish bite, right? And if we're looking at, at Jacksonville clams, they're small ones. So when I'm looking at, that's pretty big, right? And it matches the size, doesn't it? Pretty similar, okay? So that or that, right? If you go pull out some coquina clam uh, shells, they're about that big, okay? So don't always have to use a, all your fish bites on one trip, right? So, coquina clam has been working good for a lot of people, okay? Uh, but I've been, white crab has been my number one uh, this year. Any questions on the uh, ocean salt? You can't so, overdo it, right? Yeah, so one of the salting clams, the one thing you don't, I've heard use iodine or don't use iodine. When I first started, guess what I used? Iodine. Did I catch fish? Yeah, I did. But you know, they said, oh, the iodine put another flavor in there. Okay, so <laughs> so I said, okay, it's probably not. Probably shouldn't use that. And I can get a big thing of salt for 64, 68 cents, right? It's not going to kill the bank. I, what I do is on my on my cooler, I have a, a Coleman cooler, and it has a little trough. So what I'll do is, I'll, if I don't have fresh clams, I just have the bag clams, the uh, Duncan or the Baitmaster. There's another company I don't remember what it is, but they're all. One of them has a lot of orange on it, which means something, right? Uh, you can see it a little bit better. So I just take that bag and I'll open it up, dump the extra juice in the water because that's doing what attracting more fish. And then I'll cut all the all the black stuff out and I'll throw it on in the, in the water. And then I'll just cut them in slices so I can use them uh, when I'm fishing that day. But then I'll just cover them with salt. I'm going to leave them out in the sun. Now, you can't hardly do it because people, on this beach because people feed the birds. Okay? <laughs> they'll, Don't they'll feed, feed the birds. Fast, trust me. So they'll come to right and lay it on your cooler and eat your But uh, what I do is I let them dry out with salt on my cooler flip them over halfway, salt them again, and then I always have a, a, a one gallon Ziploc bag with a uh, paper towel in the bottom. So what I'll do is put the paper towel in, I'll salt the paper towel, grab the clams, I want to done fishing that day, throw them in there, seal it up, put it in the freezer.
and I, then I put more salt on top of that. Salt, you, you can't overdo the salt because what you're trying to do is suck the water out. So what happens is when you go to the beach the next time, you, t you have another paper towel, you take that one out when you're walking right up through here and you throw in the trash and you put your next paper towel in there because it's now took all the water out. The paper towel has most of the water. Okay, so then put another paper towel in there. When it hits the water, they go whoop. Yes, they do. They suck the right back. In. Suck the water back right back in. So now we're now we're fishing fresh live, which is not, but yeah. it looks like it. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Salting is the easiest way. Now, uh, Killian at uh, Native Salted Baits had shut down his business, and I'm like, no, that I don't mind salting them, but you can get them from him directly, and not not have to do all the work. Good and, plans too. And good plan. So he's going to open it, open it back up the shop. I just got a new warehouse, and a couple weeks they should have been available again. So that was I, I begged and pleaded because <laughs> I, I doing a salt and clamps at the house just not a good idea. Not with a wife. And I have a nice, I have a wonderful wife. <laughs> Any questions on the clamber? With fish bites, like flavor, trying to match the flavor of your bait and mix and match. If I got sand fleas on there, do I want to keep like sand fleas fish bites? It's all preference. It's all uh, like the coquina clam. Okay, it looks like the eggs, doesn't it? So if I want, why I would use fish bites versus just natural bait is to have something if the current's like this, and it blasts my sand flea off. But if I throw a shrimp out and I know the shrimp went off, and then but I don't have to reel it in right now because I still have a sand flea fish bite on it. It's just another alternate way to be able to not fish naked and empty, right? So that's one of the best ways, best things about fish bites is you'll have it on there. So, okay? So what flavor is the question, right? I, I told you what I like, which was white, white crab. <laughs> but I like crab, fish and crab, right? But I use yellow. Uh, clam. I use white clam. If you look at our online store, you'll see which colors I like. I don't care if I don't. I just don't believe in some Speaking of that, with baits and fish bites, one run out, they might be all biting on sand fleas, and you move to the next, and you never have a hit. You put on the clam, and they're hitting that. Oh. It could be within 100 yards of each other. Why? I don't know. And if I did, I'd write a book. But that's just how fish are. So don't ever get set to where you're just like, I gotta just use one bait. Okay? I mean, that is the key to failure in fishing is sticking to one thing and one thing only. Always have different. You want to offer a variety to these fish because they don't eat the same thing every day. Any questions on the clam sand, please? We'll go to the shrimp. How we go to those next? Let's talk about shrimp. Yeah. We we are lucky here in Jacksonville. Made for shrimp. We all heard about it. You go somewhere else, take your shrimp from here. Yes. If you're going down south, take your shrimp. Uh, over on the, on the Gulf side, you know where they buy the shrimp? Publix. <laughs> Nine dollars a pound. Orange shrimp. Orange. So, we are lucky to have so much shrimp here that we can get it at uh, Atlantic Coast Seafood. We can, on Hexer Drive, I don't remember the, the lady's name. She has a shrimp boat, yeah. She, they, she owns the, the Mary, shrimp boat. Mary, Mary, Mary. Yeah, so. I call it Linda, because oh, okay. it used to be Linda, uh, the used person, but I don't remember, really know her name, but she has $3.50 shrimp, $4 a pound shrimp. I mean, bait shrimp, but they're mediums, which are awesome, right? We're lucky uh, in this area. Most most people, if, if this gets posted on the internet, you don't have the shrimp that we have. So, <laughs> sorry, you have to order it in. And if, you, if they don't have good dead bait, do what I do, I buy live shrimp. Oh, there's not a, I usually have four dozen live shrimp whenever I go fishing. Because one, if I don't use them, they freeze well. I freeze them in salt water and they were alive, so they're good. But uh, when you're buying shrimp, I'm just going to tell you, if you're buying shrimp anywhere, any bait shop, look at the shrimp before you say, give me a pound. Ask to look at the shrimp. Because if there's any black on them, pass. That black means they were frozen when they were already going bad. And if you happen to see a box sitting somewhere that says from Ecuador, pass. Because those are farm raised shrimp, it's not the same. You will catch a few fish on them, it doesn't compare to the local shrimp. So now, right now, they're getting at all the bait stores, we have West Coast shrimp. 
You all know the difference? They're a little bit, like our local shrimp, they have the long fillers. So these are the, these are the West Coast shrimp. Much stockier shrimp, okay? But they work. And that, when that's all you can get, they work. And we're going to talk about how you hook them. If I'm whiting fishing, do I want to use that whole piece? So what I do, I'm going to kill them. Is everybody okay with that? No, don't kill them. Okay. See what I did there? I popped the head. Important, leave those fillers, those hands, okay? I pinched the tail. Now I got two pieces. So that's how one would be hooked, barely even the hook exposed. I think that's have this thing. Sometimes I double them up anyways with clam and shrimp, you never know. And then that's how the shrimp will look. What does that mimic when it's in the water, do you think, with those little bank like that? It looks like a sand fleet on it. Okay, so that's a medium shrimp. Let's see. It next, next question. Uh. If you're buying bait that doesn't have legs on it, <laughs> what happened? <coughs> you could have died, right? Yes. Right. The legs are key. They're a lot. That means it's fresh. That's yeah, fresh. Smaller shrimp. I'll actually use the whole thing for whiting and popping up. All I do, pinch the tail off. Now, this is how I have it on my hook. For the smaller shrimp, I use the whole thing. Uh, Spencer, so, what's your method of uh, uh, freezing or storing live shrimp to use it for another day? When you go to the beach, bring an empty jug, get you some salt water, and switch the water. What you don't want to do is you buy them at the bait store with their water. You come out here and completely switch the water over real fast. What do you think is going to happen to the shrimp? It's going to shock them because let me tell you this water they're getting at the bait store that they're in is not as salty as the water out here or as the water out here so i switch half and half by the time i leave it's all all salt water from out here and what's funny is the shrimp will actually change colors they'll get lighter that's what they do and when i go home like aaron said i just got aquarium pumps i got them everywhere my, it's like running a uh, pet store in my house <laughs> I just hook it into the wall and then it gives me all the oxygen I need and I'll bring extra water. So if when you go and open your bait bucket with live shrimp, if there's any fish smell at all, that means it's time to change water because that's urine. Like when you have an aquarium at home, they shouldn't smell. Same thing with the with the shrimp. Now for the way we hook the live shrimp, it's very important if you want to have a live shrimp. You can hook them any way, but that doesn't guarantee you. <laughs> Let me find them. Good. This is a big shrimp. Boom. Wow. Oh, yeah, he's, he's not happy about, about something. All right. Can everyone see the little black dot that's right? Yep. What happens if you hit that little dot? He you know, did. It's like don't hit the red button in the Simpsons, right? Do not push this. Yeah. Button, okay? <laughs> So what I do, I'll pass this around because it's hard to show, but right at the, their horn, there's a little clear spot. You can simply just push that hook. Between the black dot and the eye. Before, yep, like that. This shrimp will literally live on this hook until something eats them. Next thing is, it's uh, activity of a shrimp, of fishing uh, a float rig or whatever. If your shrimp isn't, isn't active, are you going to have any luck? Probably not. So every time that the, your, that shrimp becomes inactive, put it beside. You're going to use them on your. You don't just throw it in the water because you can reuse that shrimp again on a double dropper or whatever else. You can freeze it. You do that. Now, Spencer talks about having an aerator to keep your shrimp. How many people know that you're going to have to walk about 800 yards <laughs> to a mile to the your favorite fishing hole, but you do not want a cooler full of water. What do you do? You do what all the old guys used to do before aerators. Wet the newspaper, get your shrimp, wet yep. the newspaper, put it on the ice, or put it flat on the ice, put a piece of cardboard, put the shrimp in there, 
right on, right on the paper, put the paper on top of them, put water on them, put the salt water back on them. They'll stay alive. Okay? You pull them off, they, now you're not going to fish it. You're not going to fish it with a float rig. You'll, you'll have six out of your dozen that will still be alive after an hour, two hours. But if you have three dozen, you, you'll be able to fish a float rig if you want down the beach. But the problem is, is when we're in a surf park, it's hard to, it's hard to push a bunch of water. Especially if you're going over big dunes, and so that's an easy way. Just I, I just put it. I, I have a little bucket that I just put the newspaper down, pour some, pour some of the water that I got with the shrimp, throw the shrimp in there, fold it over, put some more water on it, and then put it right on the ice. Put my bucket on the ice. They'll stay alive. Spencer, do you know what model pumps you have for your uh, home aerator? The, the bubbles. Just the cheap ones. The uh, it's like twenty bucks. The waterproof. Gotcha. I, okay. But nothing's waterproof. So, I mean, I go through them. Yeah. But uh, if you're just buying live shrimp strictly for bottom fishing, you don't need an aerator. I just I go to the bait store, hey, I want four dozen in a Ziploc bag, put them straight on the ice. Fresh. The key is fresh. The fresher, the better. Like you said, if those shrimp don't have legs on them, you think those are very fresh? No. So they're not fresh. I just bought a dozen. But usually I got four dozen in there, and they'll last me until I'm out. Late the yeah, or until the coolers full and the limits met, and I just let it go to the birds. Any questions on the shrimp? So if you're new to surf fishing, you just learned all these different techniques and styles, and, and what what makes you go catch fish? The right bait, the best bait, the best place. Put it in the super highway. But if you don't want to deal, if you're going coming from work and you have your fishing rod and you go, I want to go, I can go get some shrimp, but maybe I'm running late, you can just grab a pack of fish bites. They're already in there. They're already ready to go, right? If you just want to come enjoy the beach without getting your hands all dirty, without getting messy, because clams are messy. Yes, crabs are. are super messy, right? Uh, watch my video if you want to know how to catch clam crabs. We just didn't, we didn't have any. Uh, crabs they had were dead, and I, last time we had a dead one, and we popped it open, it didn't smell so good, so I didn't want to do that again. Do, uh, talk about crabs, uh, if you watch my video, you know I fish a lot of crab, but what what is the key to fishing crab? Live. Crab knuckles and live. If they go, if the bait shop says, oh, we got frozen ones, go ahead and choose something else, okay? So, uh, you'll have a better chance with just fish bites than a dead crab. Now, can you can you fish a half a crab? Can you fish a quarter crab? What what is the? We we all hear it. Redfish, redfish are coming. Redfish. I'm gonna go soak a half a blue crab, or I'm gonna soak a whole blue crab. Do you need it? If you watch my videos. You don't need it. A knuckle, a knuckle is just as as good as a as the whole the whole thing. You just have to keep switching it out. What's the knuckle? Uh, like if on a crab. It's like this, I got fingers, I break the crab in half, so then I have its legs, I cut its legs off, and then right down the joint, I'll cut it, and then I'll hook it through the finger, through its leg hole, through the hard part. Okay. That's enough. It looks like this. Yep. Is, it, is there any other, uh, okay, the next one is squid. Does squid work here? Yeah. Negative, yeah. negative. Yeah. negative. Yeah. It does work. Out in the ocean. If you yes. want to target what? Vermilion stingray. snapper. <laughs> stingray. Yeah. You want to catch a big stingray? It, it works. Now you go down to Jupiter, closer to the rocks, squid on fire. Pompano will eat it. You put squid out here, you put squid in Brunswick, you catch whiting. You put squid here, you catch the biggest stingrays you've ever seen. They just love it. So, I don't fish squid. So, I forgot to mention how we have that bait hook. When I'm targeting drum and sheep and shrimp, this is how I hook it. When I, it works right, Matt. That's how you see. Do I hook it any other way with shrimp? All right. Just like that. Man, you, and with the drum and sheep bed, you'll usually feel one or two. If you feel a lot of fast taps, it's either pinfish or spade fish. A drum or a sheep bed, it's a, if you're just looking at the rod, it'll be like this. And then it'll just go, okay? If it's, 
These are the worst stats when you see girl like that. That's usually nothing good, guys. The only, the only time it's good is if you're out on a sandbar and you know there's popping over there, and you see it wiggle real fast and go slack. You know you got a pop. But for the drum and sheep head, that's how I uh, target it. We forgot to mention, because it's sort of rough, but when we look out at the ocean, we, the sandbar has revealed itself. So when you look, start at the pier and go left, you see a streak of right water out about 100 yards that goes all the way. Does everybody see that? There's a, there's a, there's white water everywhere, but in shallow, it sort of smooths out. And then you go further out and you got all the whitewash. That's the sandbar. The sandbar runs all the way down the beach. So if I'm coming now to fish, if I'm coming, I'm putting two rods in shallow, and I'm going to put two rods on the sandbar. And wherever you're getting the hits, that's where you want to put all your rods. Because they're not always going to be on the sandbar, and they're not always going to be right behind the breakers. All right, so you see the person, the surfer right there. See that water just get big? You see where the surfer is? Dark water, right? Out, out. That's where I like to fish too. Why? It's right on the front side of the super highway, right? That's where all the bait's getting collected. When the when the it's getting sucked out, you can see that she can't get back in. She's got to wait. So the bait's all getting sucked right there where she's at. And I don't know why she's coming in right there, but right in the middle of all the fishermen. But I that's a whole different story. Uh, but does everybody see that little hole, that dark water right there? There's a sandbar which is white, and then it turns dark water. Does everybody see it? It's just yeah. a different color. It's not white. That is, there's a big hole right there. Now, is that, does that mean that's where you have to cast it? No, you're gonna have to play around in that little area to see where the fish really are, right? Now, are they gonna be on the sandbar? Yeah, because on the back side of that, all that water, that brown water, the greenish water, is where all the bait from the sandbar on the other side is starting to collect. Yeah. So if you can't get it to the sandbar, get it get it as far to the whitewash as you can, and then try that. Then move it back a little bit. Move it in close. But to find that super highway, we can't see the super highway here, but we know it's somewhere there, right? So if you go if you go down uh, another hundred yards, there's really no darker water it's all whitewash I'm probably not fishing there it is a sandbar it is shallow but we want to have the super highway so the fish come in and see it a uh, little different all depends on what type of fish that you're trying to target to right Papa and I are going to eat off the sandbar okay they're going to they're going to be picking sucking it in spitting it out sucking it in spitting it out whining same thing okay but Pompano are also sight feeders, so if you they coming down the beach, they see you in the in the big super highway, they're gonna keep falling, boom. You got your pompano. But if they're really eating, or if they're just traveling, traveling means they're just going up and down the beach, then you wanna be in the super highway. If they're really feeding, if it's feeding time for them, which is almost always, but if they're just moving down the beach to get somewhere else. You want to be in that super highway. You don't want to be necessarily on top of the sandbar. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes kind of makes your brain think a little bit about when you're out there. Yes, sir. Some of your videos, I uh, remember you calling for, for that happy water. Yes, sir. Can you explain that? Yeah. Well, uh, today it's all happy. Yes. So yes, what? So if it's dead flat. You can walk down the beach and you go, there's something different. It's flat and then the water's going like this, or it's sucking out. That's the happy water, that's what. So you're walking down the beach and when you find that spot, throw it in there. Throw it in the middle of it, throw it to the left, throw it to the right, throw it over, throw it if it's a, if you know. It shimmers. Yep. It shimmers, yep. Right. When it's flat like that, look for the runouts too. Yep. We did a video on Facebook from Montevideo, I think in February. West wind flat, I walked almost two miles to the spot and loaded a cooler full of wadi because I found an area where there's a trough that runs along the beach, knee deep, and it exited out into the main trough and it created a run out and the wadi were stacked in it. Why? It was sucking all the bait. It was the only place there was any food. So 
and they're sucking all that right. lotion in there, yep. and they were just going to hang when out there. When it comes to runouts, which ways do you give time to? Because I like, see real small ones, and then there's these. Is, is there any reason to bother with the real small ones? I'll say this. When I'm fishing, if one pops up near me, I'll cast right to it. Because you, they're... It's weird how they'll just randomly pop up and then disappear. Yeah. So it happens to pop up near you, cast a line in it because there's fish in it. But I like to find one that's sort of permanent because you know almost 95% of the time there's going to be some good fish in it. And like the, the smaller ones, Yeah. you know, do they go out as far? Not usually. But that's not always a bad thing because there's times where I'm catching all my weight just over the breakers. I'm not even reaching the sandbar. So. In the circle, you know, have you seen those? Yeah. Wonderful. Sit your cart right on the back of it. Fish right. them both. Yeah. yeah. Then, then when you find the fish, move all your stuff to that side. Right. Right. I forgot to mention with this float rig, it's not only for fishing the piers or rocks. It can be used in the surf. Obviously, not on a day like this. You need a sort of flat conditions. Same concept though. You find a run out. You can throw this float rig right in the middle of the run out. What's the run out going to do with it? Just keep your bell open, let it take it to the end of the run out, and let it sit there. Because there's going to be pompano. The last seminar we had, a guy said he took a float rig and caught some monster whiting on the end of a run out using the float. It's not just for structure fishing. And it's wonderful um, if you're fishing off of a dock. Yes. <laughs> I will. There will be pictures going up today uh, from yesterday's catch. But, uh, the difference with, you see all the clackers, right? Well, the clackers, clack, 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 it's supposed to emulate a shrimp, right? Well, Spencer gave me the trick. Ooh, maybe the fish are in a different water column, right? Maybe the fish are deeper. Well, if you're on a kayak, you can control where you're going. And if you're in shore, when, when it comes to, when that water is coming around the corner, that's where the fish are gonna be sitting. You don't have to have but this much leader. Right? to catch that fish. But if they're in the water column at eight feet, you're not catching them with that clacker rig. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. There's a thousand different ones. It's everybody everybody thinks, float. Right. Which is, there's nothing wrong with it. No, they, they work, they work, but they just don't work for Everything for has their own water. application. Yeah. Ocean fishing is not one of them. Yeah, nope. Because if I'm catching fish at eight foot down and all you have is occasion thunder, yeah. occasion you're like, okay, well, I need to put an eight foot leader on. You think you can cast that? You'll be like that and you go, Know, you're going to end up with a hook in the ear, and I'm going to sit there <laughs> filming it. So, yep. Hi, hi. Okay, I hate, this is almost like a bluebird sky. I hate bluebird skies and a high, very high pressure. Yeah, and fishing, as, as you've seen, has been pretty darn slow. I, I look on face our uh, internet every day at the pressure, and it's been really high lately. So high pressure. There are days when they'll bite. There's just some days where follow a pattern and you know okay this pattern never works out but then you have that one day with that same pattern and you kill the fish high pressure bluebird skies i do not like i like the pressure to be moving i don't like it when it's high what did you say time tide tide jack speech as you can see you need to fish last two and a half hours of outgoing first two have been coming you go further south where you have high impact beaches you can fish a lot longer Better to, the bigger the slope to the beach, the longer you can fish it. Jack's Beach at high tide, you see the watermark is up here to the uh, these cones up here. So if I'm back there, you see how far a cast that is to where the trough is? But you can fish it over there. You can find that hole and fish it. You see, you see, that, you see that super highway now up here? And those, and when we're at high tide, everybody see the water in it still? They're, they're sitting on the sandbar camera's on the sandbar, but right behind that camera this way is that a little bit of a super highway, isn't it? It's going to fill in there. So if this is the only place you can fish, I would fish down a little bit farther towards that hole down there. Absolutely. Because that's going to be where all the water's coming in, and the fish will be coming in here. And you can see right here, there's another hole, isn't there? Right where all the kids are setting up, there's all these little pivots. Yep. Fish at uh, high tide, those fish are sitting right in their feet. And uh, moon, moon um, full moon, as you know, there's a lot of different theories. For the most part, the full moon is usually not good for surf fishing. But what I will say is, 
bigger whiting come in on the full moon. I've caught big whiting all summer long on the full moon. It's usually not a lot of numbers, but I posted a picture the other day on Facebook. I had it's a day when I had like a 24 inch red and eight or 10 whiting. It was on a full moon, and every single whiting was over 15 inches. Full moon. When the pier is open, I'd catch sheep that year round on the full moon. Full moon would get out of here, and I'd go back to trout fishing because I said, well, they're done. But if it were me, if I had a time to fish, I want overcast days, outgoing tide, northeast at 5 to 10. That would be my pristine conditions. Just enough movement in the water. Northeast will clean it up. You know what I mean? That's when I, Anytime I see northeast 5 to 10 in the forecast, I start going like this with my hands because I know it's going to clean the water. I do the same thing when it's full moon and it's about to storm. That's uh -huh. Boom! They're ready. Just, just get here. You just have to show up. And then with the storm, with, with the right yeah. bait. Right. Don't, don't. The fish fight great during the storms, but I don't want anybody get hit by lightning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you, I've been out on the pier like a dummy where my rod starts coming and I, it's time to go. But honestly, you can get here right before the storm in a safe time or right after it passes. Those fish are being just, and this ain't a kingfish seminar, but when the pier was open, it worked like clockwork. Nothing all day. The minute an uh, afternoon thunderstorm came through, everybody would run inside and leave their rigs out. Well, there's always that one guy who says, ah, I'll stay out here anyways. Well, he's hooked up. Every time the storm would go through, the kingfish would start, start hitting. Same thing with all the fish. It's just, it's not real real safe to be out there when you're uh, lightning on. I said before the storm. Yeah. yeah. Not during Don't, the storm. You'll be on the news real fast. Yeah. I'm, you only need it once. Yeah, you've got your lures and all that you have mentioned, yeah. and the spoons. Yeah. When is the, the good conditions to fish that? It'd be hard to fish it today, but like I said, 5 to 10 miles an hour, 2 foot surf. In Jack Speech, you're going to have to fish the low tide with how about, it. How about like when it's like a lake? Is that a good time to Absolutely. do it? Absolutely. Yeah. First thing in the morning or right before dark. So you, when would, it's would like, you be wasting your time like in the afternoon? Or? It all depends on water clarity. If you've got an afternoon time to fish, Water's flat and super clear. I'm probably not fishing. No movement, super clear. The ospreys are zoning in on everything, moving those fish. They want a little bit of action. Or, a little, or if it's cloudy and overcast, those gotchas on a calm day. Yeah. Oh man, because they see that little sl silver. Yeah. Yeah. Diamond jigs. I, I don't know if I show those. It's just a jig, like a little weight with a treble hook. You can cast them a mile in the fish, the Spanish bluefish level. How about like those 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 pompano, uh, they call them uh, banana? Oh yes. How do, how, do you just pull that in like a spoon? Man, it's, I've tried to fish them with them. in the surf down here. It's really hard. It's so much easier to fish them. They say, that's what I've heard. You throw them, them out, like a, I let yeah. it sink to the bottom, jig up twice, let yeah. it sink, jig up twice. And man, it, it's exciting when you see a school of pompano chasing that thing. To, yeah. And butt tails, the little butt tails, pink and white. Uh, Pink and yellow bucktails for an half okay. ounce jig. And we, like with the bucktails, do you just like jig it? That's all I do. That's Let it hit the bottom jig up. Okay. Some people tip it with shrimp. I've never tipped them and I've caught a lot of fish on it. When it hits the ground, what happens? Sand. Gotcha. If you watch sand fleas, when they're going out in the wave, they're sort of skipping along. Yeah, yeah right, right, right. So that, that's the action is when, when you drop. Let it hit the sand. Let it hit the boom. And then pull it back up. Because once, once it hits and you pull it back up, a, a puff. Puff. Yeah. Right. And then all of a sudden, that fish, 30, 40 yards away, sees it. Yeah. What? But sometimes they're not going to see it today. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So yeah. it's really popular down south where the water's good. Yeah. Uh, okay. Flagler, Flagler Beach, use of St. Augustine, a little bit cleaner. Here it's not as common. It's, we just don't we don't use them because the water's not as good. Gotcha. Thank you. And one more thing we didn't we haven't mentioned at any of the seminars. When we get a northeast wind after a lot of rain down south. I don't know if you've ever seen it where you'll see the water line coming down the beach and it's a tannin color. That's where all that fresh water has moved up to St. John's and has decided to exit out on our beach. If you see that come through, from what I've learned, go ahead and pack up and leave. Because what it does is it creates a salinity change, a drastic one, because it's mostly fresh water. <laughs> It takes a day or two to level back out and then the fish will bite. But numerous times I've been catching wadi, pompano, and the surf in that. It's not a clear line, it's a river line, I call it. If it comes down the beach, yeah. the water turns brown, 
but it's a clear brown and the fish just completely stop. What I want to see is that like light blue, light green. Anytime I see that green water, I know we're going to catch fish. It's just, it's, it's like, like heaven for fish. The salinity green. of water is, everybody's been to one time, right? Salt water, been out there and it hit you and got your mouth. You know how salty it is. Well, if you know, if you go, I don't, I don't know why I'm not catching fish. Sweep some of that, put it in your mouth, you go, I got, I got to move. Okay. So there's no salt in the water. So you can taste the salinity uh, if you're still really struggling with trying to find the fish. But it's pretty easy just to wash your hands first. There, would be, there, grab there was one time, I think it was like 2012, we had all those hurricanes. They never hit here, but we kept having them, so we had a lot of fresh water. And I just remember for a solid week, the water here was completely brown and clean. And the reason I knew we weren't going to catch no fish, we saw three alligator guards swimming down the beach. I said, that's not normal. You know what I mean? It's time to go. You're not going to catch them. Uh, they were big. Well, what was fun, I was telling everybody, look at those big trout. And they were trying to throw them. They weren't trout. They were trout. They didn't know. I didn't tell them. They had fun trying to catch them. Any other questions? Yep. Now, you touched on this a few minutes ago about the diamond jigs. Yes. Do you have any other recommendations for foreign mammals and blues and Spanish from the beach, not from the beer? No, the diamond jig from the beach. Because it's a heavy lure and you can launch it a lot, especially on a spinning rod, it gets a lot of distance. It's almost like a Sputnik type shape but with a treble hook on the end. And it launches it. Uh, spoons, if you're using a spoon, what I've seen people do from the beach is a small egg sinker. A liter and then the spoon, and what you do is throw it out real, real fast, let it sink, real, real fast, let it sink. So I've seen a lot of fish caught like that. The speck of trout will hit it too. I I like, I like the, the Hayden uh, Super Spook Juniors, right, at this time of year. A little smaller bait. I don't like the big ones, the, the Super Spooks. They're a little big for the surf right now, but I do like the, the Super Spook Juniors. One with the red head. Look like a speckled trout. You're talking about plastic things now, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Just casting something out into the surf. Uh, daylight, sundown. But if, if I'm going lures, like I said, early morning, late afternoon. Unless it's overcast and you can reach it, then do it. But for the most part, like throwing top order in the surf, like you said, track it off. You want that sun just barely coming up because those trout, they're in inches of water overnight. So are the every clean the fish and they're full of donax and sand fleas, you know those fish have been in very, very shallow because you've never seen any donax or sand fleas just randomly out in 30 foot of water. So, any other questions or anything we didn't cover? Yep. Now if you're throwing, if you want to throw artificials off the surf, should you be walking out to the trough and casting parallel to the beach or should you be going straight out? I usually throw straight out. Now if it's like a calm morning where you can, you know we get those mornings in the, the summer here where it's completely flat. I will wait out and I'll throw north and south. Or if you're going along the beach and you find a nice slough that's real deep. Uh, my buddy last year, he caught trout south Jack's Beach. There was a slough. He walked on the sandbar and was pitching towards the beach and working the, and he was catching big trout. So, they have it. I've seen reports that in Hatteras they're now catching big pompano. So that's part of the school that was just in Florida. But the water's still 72, so that's still good water temperature for uh, pompano. But once the pompano are gone and thin out, like he said, don't waste the whole day trying to catch one. Unless you really like to eat pompano, I would not waste the whole day trying to catch one. I would go with, with what's around, drum, redfish, and trout. Just switch it up. Once you start catching a few of those, you'll and you haven't fished one before, you'll thank me. They're fun, they're good eating, and it gives you another fish. We talked about fishing. Jacksonville has a great fishery. Choose the fish that you like to eat. Choose the, choose the fish, the fish that are here. Don't just, oh, I'm gonna go catch pompano. Are the pompano here? The Hatter's pompano that are out north right now, I caught those fish yep. eight weeks ago at Deaconot Park. The video's coming. You <laughs> caught that? You caught four? Yeah, four and a big redfish that day? Yeah, that's all they have. Yep, that's all they have. 
So that those fish are there. Out. Now, there are reports that they are farther south, Pompano. There is a lot of Pompano in Crescent Beach right now. Just so you know, Greenland, Crescent Beach, they're still coming. South of Flagler, there's a big, they saw them at, in Jupiter uh, two weeks ago. Two, two big schools of flowers. We got around. It's been so a lot cooler than spring. spring. Okay, they haven't passed. Yeah. Normally, with all the pier logs I have, the old pier that I kept, this time of year the water's already 78. Yeah, it's, it's 72 still. now, so we're still good. It's been a, a cool spring, sort of say, for this area. So, and we're still we still got plenty of time. Just find you don't have to have crystal clear water to catch pompano. Just so you guys know that we we hear it, we hear it. You have to have you have to have clean water, clean water, clean water. The video they feed at all times. It's just the day that you were fishing, it was relatively dirty. It wasn't crystal clear. And the time, the day before that, I limited it out. So they, they're here. We just have to find out where they're at. The reason me and him like fishing the clean water, though, is what does it keep away for the most part? What bites in dirty water? Catfish. catfish. Okay, the catfish. Now the cell cats are moving through now. They'll actually get in the clean water. Just one little tip, if you catch a cell cat and you got, you know that slime, the slime they leave on your rig? Change rigs. I learned a long time ago, if that slime stays on there, you're probably going to just keep catching catfish. It's a nasty, and even if you miss it, you really, you'll see it dripping, you know, it's a cell cat. And because they move in big schools. When this pier is open, you would see a black cloud coming. And wherever people's lines were, they'd start going off. Okay, so if you get into a school of cell cats, just put your rods down for like 10, 15 minutes. Go catch some samples and try again, because they don't stay stationary, the cell cats. They just keep moving. So, just another little tip. Snook here, no, you start at Milano and South. They start getting warmer. And warmer. Now in the river they're showing they're starting to become more of a permanent fixture. Uh, if the water we get really warm winters, we'll start getting on this pier. But I heard the closest pier they get them on is flat. And that's not a lot, but they've seen them and caught them. Uh, if you came out here trying to target a snook, you're probably gonna be catching a uh, fish. Yeah. Now you go to Sebastian, it's snook heaven. Yeah. Further south you go, the bigger the snook. Any other questions? I will. If I don't stop fishing, it's right now. Did we answer everybody's questions, or is there anything? Okay, one more bait. Yeah. Is there any difference in the bait you throw on a double crop as opposed to the fish finder? You use bigger baits? Is there anything you wouldn't use on the fish finder? Pretty much the same. Yeah, like I said, if the shrimp are small, I still put the whole shrimp on the uh, double drop too. Yep. We good? Yeah, you just want it as fresh as possible. Okay. With the DS about sheep head and the fresh shrimp, if you buy just straight up dead shrimp, you notice how it's already soft? What do you think a sheep head's got to do with that? It, Tear it's it off. It's going to rip right off. You have that fresh shrimp, it's more firm. They tend, if you leave those legs on, they tend to swallow it. And that's a good thing when you're sheep head fishing, because as you know, when they get lip hooked and you're fighting them in the surf, a lot of times they come off right at your feet. The last 10 feet of landing a fish in the surf is when most fish come off. The Carolina rig, what did you say, what, what fish do you target with that? Drum, red, speckled trout, okay. whiting too, but like I said, you cannot really use this if there's a lot of current. Because you're just constantly moving down. So, there you go. You, you can, with this, the, uh, so, so that, that's a great, that's a great question. So, if I'm using the sponge, I don't use, I don't use, Sputnik. I've never used it. That's all I've ever used. So I put a Sputnik on there. Everybody says it tangles up. Well, yeah, it tangles up. But it'll tangle up with that too. But the problem is, is once you cast it out, let it sit, go ahead and loose line it so it gets a little farther away. So it's not, let, let it do its thing. 
That's how I saw it. If I mean, this That's is the closest rig. thing to a Carolina rig without it being a Carolina rig. And this Sputnik, it won't get, it doesn't really get tangled up. Yeah, no, it's a river, river rig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, very yeah. simple. And it works too, yeah. But like you said, with the Sputnik on this, it does get a little bit harder because it tends to want to wrap. Depends but on how long it's used. Yeah, yeah. Because you have, you have bait. Yes, sir. So as, as far as the bait goes, you know, the, the sand fleas, I know they sell frozen ones. So if I got mine and I'm in a pinch, can I, I mean, do they actually work, the frozen ones? You know, like I can't always get fresh. So <laughs> if I got, I want to hang it throw it away when I get the next one, you know? I really saw. We'll have to no, work no. something out. You just call me when you're going fishing. I'll make a delivery. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, do they actually, I mean, the brand, so the you, one like, you got the brine idea and then you have the fresh idea. Fresh is always best. That's yeah, but I'm saying like the ones I got today, if I can't go fishing until Wednesday, can I freeze them or do I try to keep them alive or just try to find some more? Put them in an aerator. Huh? Put them in an aerator. Yeah, okay. So you don't think, so you, personally, you don't think frozen ones actually are worth it then? That means no. That's fine. That's all right. You want an honest answer? I'm not going to buy them or freeze them, but you don't think they're going to work. We got, what type of fishing are we doing? Are we popping out of their sight feeder, right? If the water's clear, yeah, they might work, right? But if, you, if the water's dirty, what are you going to probably catch with, a, with an animal that's dead? Probably a cat. Or a stingray. It's going to put out a different way. I just want to know what's going on. I haven't had any luck with brine sand fleas unless it's in the winter. There's no sand fleas available, uh -huh. and then they're sight feeding. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of the. So, I don't know if there's a different, like, freshly frozen. Like, the ones I got today, if I don't use them, can I freeze them? Try them tomorrow, or try them on two days, and put them on the report for us. Yeah. I, I don't know. Spencer, 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 Spencer's awesome at using sand fleas. I, I don't use yeah. sand yeah. fleas. Yeah. 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 You're good. Uh, we're going to just wrap this up real quick. But if you guys need anything from me, I'll be up in the truck at the parking lot. Thank you, sir. Oh.